Welcome back to Technology, Innovation, and Gaming Law. Today we're going to talk about the Federal Wire Act, and again, these are abridged slides for the Gaming and Technology Law class, hopefully to help you with your uh, studies uh, and to make it a little easier for you. Uh, the Federal Wire Act was part of a legislative package back in 1961 designed to cut off activities that sustained organized crime and to help states enforce their gambling laws. Now, back in the 1960s, particularly in 1961, there was only one state with legalized gambling. There were no state lotteries. There were no Indian casinos, no riverboat casinos. Basically, the only thing you had were horse racing and gambling in Nevada, which included uh, sports wagering and uh, casino wagering in land-based casinos and land-based uh, turf clubs, things like that. So the world in 1961 was substantially different than it is today but uh, back in 1961 uh, in addition to the red scare there was the specter of organized crime that was going to destroy america so the kennedy administration uh, uh, made it a high priority to go after organized crime and the federal wire act is one of those statutes that uh, is designed to do that so, this is the pro Prohibition section of the Federal Wire Act. The Federal Wire Act is at 18 U.S.C. 1084, and it says, first of all, whoever being in the business of betting or wagering, so this is a supply-side law only, and what you'll find is with most federal laws is they are supply-side. They don't go after the better, they go after the, the uh, anybody that's involved in offering wagering. Knowingly uses a wire communication facility for the transmission in interstate or foreign commerce, of bets or information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers on any sporting event or contest, and you have a disjunctive. Or for the transmission of a wire communication which entitles the recipient to receive money or credit as a result of a better wager, another or, and then we have information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers yet again. So that information assisting language does show up more than once. So what does it mean to be in the business of betting or wagering? Well, if you go back to your materials and read the Barborian opinion, or you look at your notes, what the court there said is that being involved in the business of betting or wagering requires the sale of a product or a service for a fee involving third parties, such as customers and clients, or the performance of a function which is an integral part of such business. The defendant need not be exclusively engaged in such business. If he is an agent or an employee of the business, he need not share in the profits or losses or receive any compensation for his services. But the function he performs must provide a reg be regular and, cons and an essential and an essential contribution to the overall operation of that business. Therefore, it, customers are not mere betters, and customers are not uh, deemed to be engaged in the business of betting or wagering, even if they're professional betters. But others can be. And again, look at the Barborian opinion. You can look at the Scavo opinion as well. And the wire communication facility is generally anything that can or is regulated by the FCC. That includes internet traffic. That includes telephones, cellular phones, com uh, uh, computer communications. Even if it's a wireless communication, at some point wires are involved either in the device or in the transmission somewhere, and that's been deemed to be good enough under the Wire Act. Uh, interstate and uh, foreign commerce. There is an outlier opinion called U.S. v. Akinta. Uh, it's in your materials, but if you recall, you had uh, a racetrack with uh, uh, people involved in illegal uh, horse race wagering, uh, in one part of the state of West Virginia, you had two bookmaking operations in other parts of West Virginia. Communication was done uh, not only by walkie-talkie, but also by, uh, by telephone, long-distance lines, AT&T. And the long-distance line crossed over from West Virginia into Ohio and back. And, of course, the defendants uh, that were running the illegal horse racing operation claimed that while they might be guilty of West Virginia law, they're not federal criminals because they had no idea that the transmission crossed state lines. In this opinion, the court said it doesn't matter whether they knew it crossed state lines or didn't. They knew it was a long-distance communication. Therefore, uh, it was deemed to be interstate commerce because the, inter the long-distance phone lines crossed state lines, and they were convicted 
under the Federal Wire Act, and that conviction was upheld. So, a better wager, as distinct from information assisting in the placement of a better wager. Um, for that information placing, you might want to read the Scavo opinion. Again, Scavo was a, a person, in, uh, it, it dealt with a person that was here in Nevada that would call his friend in Minnesota with uh, sports wagering lines from various books here in uh, Las Vegas. And that was deemed to be information assisting in the placement of a wager, whether or not a wager actually flowed from that information or not, because that information was integral to the operation of the book. Even though the information wasn't part of a bet itself, things like odds, and point spreads, transmitting that information is deemed to be transmitting information assisting. Therefore, Scava was convicted under the Wire Act and others. The issue of a sporting event or contest has also come up in the in Ray MasterCard case. Now, let me, let me put this in a sort of a context for you. Uh, in Ray MasterCard was a class action RICO case against MasterCard, Visa, Discover, and other, and American Express, you know, credit card companies, claiming that they were part of a criminal enterprise uh, for online with online gambling sites, uh, and therefore, uh, because the online gambling sites were illegal and MasterCard and Visa and other credit card companies were making money off of this, they were all part of a racketeering operation. And the illegal predicate offense that was cited was the Federal Wire Act. Now, if you're the court, and this comes to you and you think about it, what would happen if the court held that MasterCard and Visa are liable for the criminal acts of the merchants that use their cards? You know, it would have a, a detrimental effect in the credit card industry because the way the credit card industry works is MasterCard and Visa have agreements with banks. Those banks either have agreements with other banks or merchant banks and merchants. And it's the merchants that are actually taking the cards. Uh, MasterCard and Visa probably, at, at least at that time, don't know exactly what every single merchant is doing. They're relying on the banks to control that. So if you make MasterCard and Visa criminally liable under racketeering statutes for the acts of the merchants, I think you bring down the credit card industry. But the issue came up in this case uh, for the credit card industry is that the pleadings only mention losses on casino gambling online, not on sports betting. And so the credit card companies filed a 12B6 motion to dismiss without uh, on the grounds that there was a failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted because they weren't involved in providing those services to sports books, at least not, not, that wasn't alleged in the complaint. And the court did hang its hat on that and, uh, and dismissed the case, stating that sporting event or contest, uh, that language in the Federal Wire Act means that the Wire Act only applies to sports wagers, period. And since the, def the plaintiffs did not allege losses on sports books and sporting activities, the, uh, the, there could be no violation of the Federal Wire Act. With no violation of the Federal Wire Act, there can't be any violation of the RICO statutes. And it was upheld in the, uh, in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. So this was, this was in uh, 2001. In 2002, uh, the Department of Justice uh, issued a letter uh, that confirmed their prior opinion that the Federal Wire Act applied to all forms of wagering. Their view was that sporting events were one thing and contests were games with uh, prize chance and consideration. While the Federal Court of Appeals, the Fifth Circuit, held in the In Re MasterCard case that sporting modified both event and contest. It wasn't two separate things. So that's where things stood. Uh, no other uh, circuit followed the Fifth Circuit. Uh, there were no reported court opinions that way until we get a court, uh, court opinion out of uh, Utah with U.S. v. Lombardo. Now, in this uh, matter, uh, Lombardo was uh, involved in providing financial services to online poker sites primarily, and he's charged with violating the Federal Wire Act, among other violations, and he does, or his attorneys do what any sane attorney would do, and they file a motion to dismiss all the Wire Act charges because he's not involved in any sports wagering, and the Fifth Circuit said sports wagering was a necessary uh, underlying act 
uh, that, that was prohibited by the Wire Act, and it was limited to sports wagering. And the court uh, in Utah said, well, it's nice. You know, we're not in the Fifth Circuit. We're in Utah. Um, and we'll take a look at it. But in a light most favorable to you, uh, the phrase sporting event or contest is only used once. And there are two other prohibitions in the in the Federal Wire Act. So you have that first prohibition about bets or wagers, the transmission of bets or wagers or information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers in any sporting event or contest. And if the Fifth Circuit's right, then maybe that prohibition applies only to sports. But then we have two others. We have a prohibition for the transmission of a wire communication that entitles a recipient to money or credit as a result of bets or wagers, or for information assist or the transmission of information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers again. And because we have that information assisting both in the first and the third prohibition, with the only real difference being that reference to sporting event or contest, the Lombardo court held that uh, the, the Federal Wire Act, even if the first prohibition applies to sports, the other two don't, because sports isn't mentioned there. Now we should take a quick look at the safe harbor. There is an exemption under the Federal Wire Act. The first one exemption is for news reporting of sporting events or contests. Now again, you'd have to be in the business of betting or wagering in 1961. You think back to that time, who would be in the business of information, uh, the business of betting or wagering, and also in the business of news reporting, and it's probably tracks in the printing racing forums. And then you have a second one, or for the transmission of information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers in a sporting event or contest from a state or country where betting on that sporting event or contest is legal into a state or foreign country in which such betting is legal. Now, what's not exempted is the transmission of the bet itself. So it's important to distinguish the bet from information assisting. Information assisting has been deemed to be things like line information, account information, uh, point spreads. The bet itself is the agreement between the bookmaker and the patron. And information that creates that agreement, you know, I want to place uh, $50 on the Bears tonight or on the Bears on Monday Night Football, that information is part of the bet. Uh, whereas line information it would be information assisting. Uh, this is what allows Nevada book operators to provide line services to books in New Jersey and Delaware and Pennsylvania and other places, even though we can't accept bets from New Jersey and Delaware and Pennsylvania and other places here in Nevada. So post Lombardo, you have the exemptions and the uh, prohibitions uh, kind of lined up here side by side. And you'll notice that under the first prohibition, you've got that uh, exemption if it's legal in both states. There's no exemption for the transmission of wire of uh, wire communication that entitles the recipient to receive money or credit as a result of better wagers. There's some question as to whether that third information assisting would be exempted under 1084B because 1084B seems to be limited to sporting events or contests. Uh, therefore, there are a, a lot more prohibitions under the Wire Act. There's a prohibition on the the transmission of bets, that communication entitling the recipient to money or credit based on a bet, and that information assisting without any reference to sports wagering that aren't reflected in the exemptions. So the exemption's very narrow, the prohibition's very broad, and a lot of the prohib prohibited activities have no corresponding exemption. Which brings us to the CTO for party gaming, and I won't, I won't uh, pronounce his name because I'll probably uh, get it wrong. Uh, I, I do want to be respectful. Um, and anyway, he was charged, uh, among other things, with violating the Federal Wire Act. This is all in your materials. And at the beginning of 2010, uh, he actually accepted a plea deal to plead guilty to violating the Federal Wire Act for his activities with online poker. Other than that, I'm not aware of any application of the Federal Wire Act against a non-sports wagering or non-bookmaking operation, uh, and I haven't found one in any reported court opinion. But in 2009, New York and Illinois sought to offer interstate online lottery products, and they sent a letter to the Department of Justice basically saying, we don't think this violates the Federal Wire Act, particularly given that 
tension created by the unlawful internet uh, unlawful internet gambling enforcement act of 2006 uh, therefore if you think we're wrong let us know otherwise we're going to go forward and start selling lottery subscriptions online to our own residents so if you're in new york you can go online and buy a lottery subscription from the new york lottery if you're in illinois you can do the same even though they're going to use out-of-state payment processors the patrons and the lotteries would all be in the same state the doj did what it always does it never responded and given the silence new york and illinois went forward however things start changing in 2010 Senator Reid and Senator Kyle worked out uh, an agreement or an agreement in principle on legislation regarding online poker nationally. Uh, and in support of that, they sent a letter to the Department of Justice in the summer of 2011 asking the Department of Justice to reaffirm its position the Wire Act applies to all activities, not just sporting events. Uh, now, if you know anything about Senators Reid and Kyle, they're at opposite ends of the political spectrum. Maybe not quite opposites, but they were nowhere near uh, the same area of the political spectrum. My Harry Reid was the Senate Majority Leader, um, yeah, Democrat. Uh, John Kyle was an extraordinarily conservative Republican senator from Arizona. Um, but despite their differences, they were able to send this letter to the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice did what it normally does. It didn't do anything until December 23rd, when it issued a new opinion uh, in response to the letter from New York and Illinois. They uh, recognized that there might be tension, but uh, they said that the Wire Act does not apply to anything other than sports wagering. Therefore, it doesn't apply to lottery activities. In addition, the Federal Wire Act only applies to interstate communications, not to communications where the better and the betting service provider are in the same state. So as it relates to New York and Illinois, because Illinois was only going to sell its lottery subscriptions to Illinois residents, while in Illinois, and New York was going to do the same thing in New York, the, the Wire Act wouldn't be implicated, even though they were going to use out-of-state payment processors. Uh, the opinion does mention the Lombardo opinion, but it doesn't address it. Um, and therefore, starting on December 23rd, 2011, the Department of Justice is not enforce the Wire Act in a manner that's inconsistent with this opinion. However, it is just an opinion. It doesn't have the force of law, could be modified in the future, could be limited, could be rescinded. Um, the net effect is we're not going to see any court opinions to the contrary because enforcement will never be done to the contrary because this is part of the guidelines for enforcing the Federal Wire Act of the DOJ currently. Now, having said this, that doesn't mean that online poker is legal. There are still other statutes, such as the Illegal Gambling Business Act that we'll talk about later, that apply to other forms of gambling. Uh, in fact, Full Tilt, Absolute Poker, and Poker Stars were all charged with violating the Illegal Gambling Business Act, not the Federal Wire Act. Um, but there are other statutes that are, that are applicable. Um, and again, this is just the opinion of the Department of Justice during his confirmation testimony then senator jeff sessions uh, now former attorney general sessions testified that he would take a look and revisit the federal wire act opinion and you can see that in the youtube link um, so there may be some some uh, appetite for doing that and with that uh, i think we'll be done with this and hopefully this helps you with your notes and helps you with your understanding if you have questions Ask them in class. Thank you.